Welcome back to Reviews with Elaine, because I have opinions. And today's opinions will be about The Thieves Gamble by Juliet E. McKenna. Uh, first of all, I really need to thank this book for providing me with so much content. It brought up so many thoughts and things that I wanted to talk about in shorts. And I think part of the reason that there was so much material to mine here is because this book does a lot of things that, yes, are the core of the fantasy genre, but also some things that just aren't as common as I feel like they should be in fantasy. Uh, but this is the story of a woman named Levick, Levac, I, I'm not sure. Uh, she makes her living as a professional gambler and an occasional thief. When she hears that a group of men are willing to pay high ticket prices for artifacts from a specific period in history, she decides to steal some from a man who once attacked her, getting money and revenge at the same time. The theft goes off without a hitch, but when she tries to sell the goods, she realizes she is in over her head. The buyers are a wizard, a scholar, and a swordsman working for the Archmage, one of the most important political figures in this world. And they know she stole this artifact. They give her an ultimatum. Either help them retrieve some artifacts from owners who have refused to sell, or they will turn her in. But little do any of them know, they are not the only ones seeking these artifacts. And the mysterious rivals are willing to kill to get them. So, I read this book because one of my favorite authors, Tanya Huff, recommended it. And I get why. There are a lot of really interesting things going on in this book. There are some really likable characters. Some of the most impressively clear and evocative action sequences I've ever read. And some elements that I just don't see in a lot of other books. Also, this book in so many ways is so reminiscent of the fantasy I was reading in the late 90s, early 2000s which is the era I discovered Tanya Huff. But also, this makes sense because this book was published in 1999. Uh, and that was an era with a very distinctive flavor to the fantasy. There was a huge pushback against what many people felt were the very tired tropes of fantasy. A lot of the stuff that nowadays people make fun of, the wish fulfillment, the big barbarian in leather being like, oh, crock, feet, uh, stuff like that. And it was an era of brassy female leads, casual gay representation, an interest in fantasy worlds that more accurately mir mirror our world's history, and a dismissal of the romanticization of the heroic quest. This is a time of roguish heroes using naughty language and shitting in the woods. And I love this era of fantasy novels. I honestly often wonder if part of the reason I struggle so hard to get published is because my writing sounds an awful lot like 90s fantasy novels because that's what I cut my teeth on. Uh, but there are some things that reading in 2023, I found a little bit tired in this book, almost too 90s. Uh, specifically, there is a little bit too much direct statements of how real quests aren't like the heroic epics. Uh, occasionally, Livic even drifts a little bit towards not like other girls with her badassness and looking at women in skirts and being like, oh, I don't like wearing skirts. Uh, and there are a few things that felt a little bit like they'd added, been added to the book specifically as a way of saying, look, I did my research. I know about history. Uh, and there's a lot of talk in the first half of this book about technological advancement going on around the world, and specifically, like, we're talking about early medieval technological advancements, things like blast furnaces, advances in smelting, and, uh, the enclosure acts, which I found a little bit distracting just because I personally think the enclosure acts may have been the worst mistake in humanity's history. Uh, but all that talk of technological advancement felt a little like it was supposed to be going somewhere, either thematically or plot-wise, and it just sort of fizzles out. It was there just to make things feel more historically accurate. And they sort of just literally stopped talking about it at some point. There's also something going on in this book that I haven't really seen since the early 2000s, and that I'm sort of glad I haven't. Uh, there was this weird little trend in fantasy novels of having sexual violence, as a disturbingly common casual threat. I feel like it came out of that desire to be more realistic and more real to life and be more honest and visceral and like objectively 
it was very common in the medieval renaissance and victorian eras that a lot of fantasy novels are loosely based in as it is common now but authors sort of just wanted to acknowledge that this was a real danger that women really faced and would face traveling alone in most of european history and that in the ultra-violent worlds that a lot of fantasy novels exist in, this is going to be a real threat. And my distaste here doesn't stem from the realism. Like, I accept that this is realistic. It stems from the tone. It's just this casually dropped thing that happens like five or six times in a book that they'll just mention it in passing. Uh, it's the reason Livick wants her revenge on the random guy she steals from in the beginning. He tried to assault her. And so we are literally, like, in the first section of the first chapter. We have barely gotten enough exposition to know where we are and who these people are. And our main POV protagonist is remembering the time she was almost assaulted. It's just a lot. And there are several other times in the book when it just sort of comes up in passing. And a couple of times it's treated really dismissively in a way that sort of feels a little bit just distasteful uh and like it's not like a breaking point for me but be aware that if you are easily triggered by discussion of sexual assault this book might not be the one for you the inverse side of that coin is i do appreciate the fact that this book was pretty sex positive like livick has sex with someone just because she wants to and though she does get emotionally attached it never develops into anything like a romantic or love romance like kind of thing uh and i appreciate that it's actually really rare that we have characters who just have casual sex that stays casual and it is so clear that this relationship is just about casual sex uh she was hitting on the gay guy like 10 minutes before and when she found out that he doesn't like women she's just like okay well this other guy seems nice let's go with him instead and i sort of love that i even love that her attachment to this guy is what drives her continued presence in the rest of the book even while it's being made explicitly clear moment after moment after moment that she is not in love with him and doesn't want to be in love with him i like the fact that it is acknowledged that two friends having sex can be a thing uh, and I also really want to talk about the overarching story here, but there's one more relatively minor thing that I need to talk about before I get to that. I am not sure if the author was unclear about which of her secondary characters was more likable, or if she just wanted to do something out of the box, but the other main POV character in this book is fucking annoying! Castle, whose name sounds way too much like casual, like that was a problem, but he is a pretentious, arrogant, self-centered suck-up, and he strongly dislikes one of our most likable characters in the book. And <laughs> to make it even worse, we find out at the end that the reason that Castle hates Shiv is because Shiv is gay, and once mistakenly thought Castle might be as well, and offered to set him up with a guy and it started a fist fight between the two of them. So not only is he an asshole, he's homophobic to boot. And a little under half of the novel is from his point of view. And I'm just like, why? Especially concerning we could have gotten all the same information if Alan was our secondary POV character. Or even if we just skipped these sections with the two of them until Darnie shows up and he could be our secondary POV character. And, like, Darnie, like, she clearly wanted us to think he was less likable, because, like, Livick hates Darnie, but he's a lot more likable than Castle. Like, he's brusque and demanding, but he's honestly not much worse than about half the heroes in fantasy novels. Uh, and instead, we're just stuck with Castle constantly whining about how the Archmage likes Shiv better than him, how no one shows him the respect he deserves, and planning ways to get ahead. And uh, we do get to see him taken down a notch or two. We get to see him drag himself through the mud, and I'm guessing that was supposed to be cathartic. But some of those scenes really felt like they only existed to show us Kazel, like, you know, sticking his own foot in his mouth. And that's just not something I really enjoy in a book. Uh, but there is one more quick thing I need to talk about before I get to the big topic. I really do not like the names in this book. Like, at all. None of them felt like they fit the characters. And some of them felt weirdly 
misgendered? Like, maybe it's just because my name, my last name is Alan, but having a girl character named Alin, it just sounds like a boy's name. And it was the name for the by far most feminine character in the book. And Darnie sounds like a little girl to me, but he's a big, strong, angry, aggressive swordsman. And, like, it would be one thing if the author was purposefully trying to do something with that, like, showing, like, something interesting going on with gender expectations, but instead it just sort of felt like the characters were misnamed. And now finally we're at the point where I can talk about the thing that is sort of the crux of what I want to talk about. The story structure in this book was just odd. Uh, like, it's one of those books of the first half of the book feels like it's just a series of events that are just happening. Uh, the characters are on a quest, but it's a really episodic and disconnected quest. There are several scenes that have no effect whatsoever on the greater arc of the story. We have a pretty good amount of pretty big time jumps. Uh, lots of society-focused world building. Like, this book had almost no, like, physical description of place, but there's a good bit of explaining governments, cultures, and how people interact. But uh, all this episodicness in itself isn't bad. I do enjoy books that are just fun characters wandering through a fun world with relatively low stakes adventures. But then suddenly, about halfway through the book, shit starts happening and everything feels like a much more traditional epic. We meet brand new characters who will become parts of the main cast, uh, though one was super obviously doomed from first introduction. Like, I don't even know why, I can't explain why, but when I met this character I was like, well, he's gonna die by the end of the book. Uh, but suddenly our slow, meandering, collect these artifacts for research purposes plot becomes a desperate race with insanely high stakes and intense urgency. There, uh, there are lives at stake, uh, possibly an invasion coming, and an incredibly powerful, like, evil villain. And even that transition is something I've seen before. Like the Ninth Reign. Uh, it's almost the exact same transition. That book starts out with them just sort of doing research that suddenly evolves into a violent, like, world-ending quest. Except it's far more obvious that it's coming in Ninth Reign. Like, there's foreshadowing out the wazoo in that book. And the quest at the beginning has higher stakes to begin with. And it directly feeds into the big quest at the end. It all feels very connected. It feels like we just suddenly start rolling downhill a lot quicker. But here, it really feels like two separate books that happen to include some of the same characters. Uh, to make it even worse, the casual sections still feel like they are the me meandering book until almost the end. Like, there's this constant tonal shifting between Livick's voice and Kazel's, where he's being whining about completing these little mini-quests, while Livick is dealing with life-and-death battles, torture, and desperate escapes. So, yeah, it just didn't quite work for me. Uh, specifically, it made the Kazel sections feel like they drag even more than they would have otherwise, considering how little I like the character. And I probably would have finished this book three days ago if it weren't for heat exhaustion, but also because every time I saw the tense and shift that warned me we were getting a Castle's POV section, I would put the book down, thinking, well, nothing important is going to happen for the next five or six pages. Might as well take a break. And I think that weird shift from one kind of book to another is a large part of the reason why the ending felt a little bit underwhelming to me. Very few of the mysteries established in the first half of the book were ever answered. Many of them were never brought up again. And I feel like they are intended to be explained in later books, but the action-y plot just sort of felt like it drowned out any conclusion that that part of the book could have had. And I feel like the falling action chapter was sort of trying to do something interesting with this. Uh, so Livick and the others are trying to return to the vibes of the first half of the book, try to return to the lives they were living and completing their little tasks and just living their normal lives, but you can feel the tension of they can't quite do it. And Livick knows this is not the end of the story and that it's a bit of a fool's hope that she can return to her no normal life with no stress, but she's still trying to do it. And that would be a really cool thing to explore in the end of a first book in a fantasy series. 
But the problem is the transition comes way too quick again. We go from epic battle to an out of the blue kiss to talking about the ship dropping them off at home in like one page. And it is complete total whiplash. But the thing is, I still really like this book. I thought it did some really interesting, unusually crafted world building. Like the world itself is nothing out of the norm for a fantasy book, uh, especially from this time period. But the way the author painted it was really cool. Uh, we get a lot of diegetic texts, which I think is the word I was looking for the other day, uh, but essays, scenes from plays, excerpts from other books inserted in these this book at the beginning of each chapter. Let me show you what I'm talking about quickly. So you can see like chapter five begins with the yeoman's almanac for the ocean coast, uh, so steer Harriot. I don't know what that means. But the important thing is it's a text written by this guy that is just a list of all the gods and what they stand for and what like festivals they do. And it's just a text within a text. And it's a really cool way to quickly impart a lot of basically broad academic information about the world the book is set in. Uh, we also get a lot of world-specific sayings, though I admit the gambling ones in specific got a little bit heavy for me. Like, I get it, Livick is a professional gambler. She doesn't need to reference the game of chance like every page. But a lot of them really did a great job of setting up that feeling of other yet familiar. Uh, there was also some serious attention paid to just the way the characters spoke. Uh, there was a lot of attention paid to the evolution of technology and culture, to how different political powers interact, and how the geography and history affects those political powers. I mentioned before in passing that I really liked the characters. Like, Livick and Shiv were great. I loved them. Uh, I loved the way their friendship developed. I loved the way they interacted. Uh, Rish was another really interesting character, and his introductory scene was honestly a masterpiece of writing secretive conversations. So Livick and Rish are sharing information with each other in a public place and can't let those around them know that they are talking about something secretive. And it's really subtle. It's done in a way that I both believe that they understand what information they're sharing with each other. Like, I'm not going, how did you get that from that? Uh, but also, I can get how those around them would hear this conversation and think it's just small talk. Uh, it made me really intrigued to learn more about that character immediately. And just in general, there's a lot in this book that I found fascinating. Uh, there's enough that I will probably read this author again. But the book's just not perfect. Uh, like, it feels like, have you ever read one of those books that, like, you sort of suspect that you're reading the least great book by a great author? That's how I felt about this book. Like, I could tell that Juliet E. McKinnon is someone I would want to read again. It's just this one wasn't my favorite.